Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Reclaim San Antonio. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's always a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Um, before we get into worship, I just want to welcome you. Thank you all for joining us. Whether you are on Facebook or YouTube, we thank you. Um, please share and like, um, and don't forget to subscribe. And um, just thank you for joining us. We appreciate your support. And I just, uh, before we start worship, I want to share this verse out of Psalms 100. Oh, where'd it go? There we go. Um, it says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. With thanksgiving having just passed, I know we hear a lot of, you know, being thankful, being thankful, which is awesome. Um, we should always be thankful. And I can tell you, the Lord, he is always worthy of our thanks. He is always worthy of our praise. So anytime we enter into these courts, anytime we enter into his presence, be thankful. There's always something to thank him for. And, and just, just enter coming in to praise him, praise him for who he is, for what he's done, even for what he hasn't done, because he is good. Amen. So let's go ahead. If you could stand to your feet as we get ready to worship, I'm going to open up in prayer. And if you want, uh, feel free to come to the front to, to worship. Lord, we thank you, God, for your goodness, God. We thank you for your grace over our lives, God. You are always good, Lord, and you're always faithful, Lord. And today, God, we bring you our praise, God. We bring you our thanksgiving, Lord. I pray that you would move, my God, in the hearts of your people this afternoon, God. I pray that your presence would be felt in this place, God, that not one person would leave the same, Lord God. I pray that you anoint the minister's lips as he speaks your word, Lord. And I pray, God, that you would just be glorified in everything that is done today, Lord. We love you and we thank you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you, I want to see you, see you high, see you high, lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, for out your power and love, as we sing holy, 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 I want to see you, let's be excited for the Lord this afternoon. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. It's you high. I lift it up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. See you high. See you. I lift it up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy.
As the spirit was moving over the water, the spirit come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the spirit was moving over the water, the spirit come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Calm down, spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will feel me. Calm down, spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will feel me. and do it again open up the gates let heaven on in come rest on us come rest on us fire and wind come and do it again open up the gates let heaven on in come rest on us come rest on us fire and wind come and do it again Open up the gates, let heaven on in. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Calm down, spirit. When you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Calm down, spirit. When you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room. You're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will feel me. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will feel me calm down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will feel me calm down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will feel me calm down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will feel me. your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Because worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. 
Worthy is your name. Cause worthy is your name. Jesus, you deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Cause worthy is your name. Jesus, you deserve the praise. Worthy is your name, cause worthy is your name, Jesus, you deserve the praise, worthy is your name. Be exalted now in the heavens, as your glory fills this place, you alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place you alone deserve our praise you're the name above all worthy is your name jesus you deserve the praise worthy is your name because worthy is your name jesus you deserve the praise worthy is your name cause worthy is your name Jesus you deserve the praise worthy is your name cause worthy is your name Jesus you deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah. Louder than the unbelief, I'll raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I'll raise a hallelujah. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes, hope will arise Cause death is defeated, the King is alive I'm gonna say 
in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Cause death is defeated, the King is alive. Sing a little louder, sing a little louder.
on, church. God is good. The King of Kings is alive. Do you hear me? Amen, church. Right where you're at, why don't we lift our hands and open up in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you, Lord. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your love, Lord, Father. We thank you for restoring our lives. We thank you for what you've done, for what you're doing, and for, we're about, for what you're about to do. Heavenly Father, I just pray right now that you anoint the speaker's lips as he declares your word. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen and amen. Thank you and welcome to Reclaim San Antonio. Go ahead and turn around and greet each other. Amen. Praise the Lord. Why don't we take our seats as we get started today? Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Who agrees with that? It's good to be in the house of God today. Praise the Lord. Amen. Just want to welcome you again to Reclaim San Antonio. Uh, we appreciate you, know, you just coming to be able to come and praise the Lord with us in person. We thank those that are online on Facebook or YouTube. Thank you for, for joining us. And uh, uh, we appreciate that. Help us out online if you would. Uh, share the video, uh, like it, subscribe to our channel. Do whatever it takes just to get the word out there that God is doing something special here through this ministry. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, so I'm just going to go over a few announcements, and then we're going to get started today. Uh, praise the Lord. How many enjoyed their Thanksgiving week? Amen. Amen. It's kind of restful, huh? I'm going to move this out of the way here. But I know that every year about this time, you know, uh, November 1st, we're going into the holiday season, so to speak. And then all of a sudden, you know what? Uh, we have things to do. We can get busy or we can get restful and we can become complacent because, you know what? It, it seems like that happens toward the end of the year. We're at the end. We're after October, November, December. These two months, they're just not OK. Now we're going to we're going to coast into the end of the year. If you're having a bad year, it's like, man, I hope this year is over already. Right. If it's a good year, you don't want it to end. There's you know, both sides of the spectrum there, but always during this time, especially when you get to Thanksgiving, oh man, we stuff ourselves like turkeys. No, um, amen, I do. Uh, but you know what? You have that great food and family comes around. You know what? Uh, let bygones be bygones. If there was some issues before, just get past it because we're going into a new season, so to speak. And I would say that it's a new season, new year, but not everything's brand new, right? And so we have to be mindful of that. But uh, before I start preaching, I'm going to go over the announcements. Man, I'm about ready to start preaching. But Wednesday night, Wednesday night, we're going to resume our Wednesday night worship and prayer. Come be a part of that uh, online. If you're in the San Antonio area, come be a part of it on a Wednesday. If you haven't done it yet this year, come be a part of it and see what God does. It's a place where we can come and just be ourselves. You know, just uh, we don't go online on camera. And then we pray for a number of things, and then we pray for one another, and we just believe that God's going to move. We expect him to move on our behalf. Amen. And then uh, make note of this. If you're taking notes, women, on Saturday, December 11th, Saturday, December 11th, my wife wants to have a women's breakfast, and she's also doing a DIY workshop during that breakfast. So I don't know what the DIY workshop is, but she says she'll save it for the ladies. So, uh, ladies, men, you're not invited, uh, but uh, December 11th, December 11th, uh, she didn't give me a time. I'm assuming it's breakfast time. If it was for me, 7 a.m., but I don't know. It, <coughs> excuse me. It might be around 10. I don't know. But just keep that in mind. Uh, December 12th, I mean, sorry, yeah, December 12th, Saturday, the Sunday, geez, my days are all mixed up. Sunday, the next day, December 12th. We are going to do our food and fellowship like we've been doing all year. We've kind of postponed it for the past couple months. But we're going to do a food and fellowship, but we're going to make it like a Christmas type theme. So it's going to be a holiday uh, food and fellowship. So there'll be more on that. But remember, uh, December 12th on Sunday. And then the last thing on Saturday, get this, Saturday, December 18th, we're having a men's breakfast. Come on, man, let's get excited for breakfast. 
Yes, December 18th. That's my favorite. December 18th, men's breakfast and devotion. So uh, we're going to get together, men, invite other men. Uh, let's break bread. Let's eat. Let's eat good. And then I'm just going to share uh, a devotion that I pray that blesses you men. Amen. Amen. So that's it for the announcements. Uh, if you have any questions after, we'll go through them. I don't have the exact times here, but we'll get that together. But we're going to receive an offering unto the Lord. So just prepare your hearts and your offering as my brother Mondo comes to receive that. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God is good. And all the time? Amen. Today I want to first give praise and thanks to the Lord for all that he is for us, that he does for us. God is so good. He's so good in my life. I see him work in my life even when, when I'm down and God finds a way to always pick me up, keep me moving. And I give him thanks and I give him praise for that. Today I want to talk about how we are using what God gives us. Many times I hear people say, you know, what I have, I earned. I worked hard for it. Nobody gave it to me. I worked. I sacrificed. I did it all to provide for my family. I was the one who did it. I created this. I was responsible for this. And then you have others that say, you know what? God provided for me. God gave me this. If it wasn't for the Lord, I wouldn't have none of it. You know, God is my provider. God is my Jehovah Jireh. He is my provider. So you got two sides. Where do you stand? Which side are you on? When you're saying that I provide, I give. You know, the Lord was confronted by Moses when God was telling him to give the commandments to his people. And Moses asked him, who do I say send me? What is your name? And what did God tell him? I am. I am that I am. So right there, when you are claiming that I, I am, I did, you're making yourself God instead of counting on Jehovah who provides for us. Jehovah Jireh. Again, when, when the Romans, they sent a legion to get Christ to, and, and he was with the disciples and, and, and they approached him and Jesus asked them, who do you seek? And Romans say, we seek Jesus of Nazareth. He says, I am he. And what happened then? They all fell. They all fell on their faces. Everybody that was there. Why? Because they were standing before Almighty God. Whether they knew it or not. When he said, I am. So we need to think about that when we consider what we do, how, what we earn, how we're charitable, how we give, you know? Are you the I am, or do you trust in the true I am, which is God? In 1 Timothy 6, chapter, nine, uh, chapter 6, 9 through 10 says, Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruins and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. We heard that earlier uh, by Pastor. The love of money is the root of all evil. For some people, money is the root of all evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So even the word tells us when we trust in that God, money, we will fail. But if we trust in God, the true provider, we will have successes. 
Pursuing or holding on to money too tightly can ruin us. In fact, this scripture uses the words like harmful and destruction to describe the results of a loving relationship with money. God gave us resources to serve and bless others. How many times do you drive down the street in the corner and you always see that person begging for money? Right? You see them all the time. And how many times do you think, it's a scam. He's just, he's just ripping people off. You know? Do we know that? You know? Do we really know that? But the Lord puts in our heart, you know what? Be charitable. Be loving to one another. Give to those that don't have. You open your window and you see them a dollar. I always give them a dollar or two or whatever I have. And, and I always attach a little scripture with it. I have scriptures made ahead of time that I give with the money. Now providing him money and plus the word of God. If they accept it or not, but that's up to them. But I was obedient in my case. I gave. I did my part. So we we almost think that way. We almost handle things that way. We need to use it to love others, to build up God's kingdom and demonstrate our trust in the Lord. Every Sunday we gather together, we have an opportunity to ask ourselves, how am I using God's gift that he has given me? Am I close-handed or generous with his financial blessings? Which are you? Let us pray. Heavenly King, we thank you, Father. We praise you and we give you glory for all the blessings that you have given us. For you are a great God, and we love you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's children say, praise the Lord. I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're going to hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, oh, will Let's give the Lord some praise. Come on, as we start today, thank you for your generosity, your liberality, and your support of this ministry for what God is doing. Amen. I, when my brother was, was speaking, he was speaking about me in the beginning. That was me saying, I did this. I achieved this. I made this money. All of those things, and God had to break a stubborn man. I'm telling you, thank you, brother. I, I didn't realize that God was my provider. I was the provider in my mind because I, I grew up in, a, in, 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 in poverty and, you know, uh, we were struggling every day. And I knew I didn't want to be that way when I got older. So my mindset was I'm going to go out and I'm going to do everything I can to make money, illegally or legally. Amen. And God broke me. But that's good. And so anyways, he, I felt like he was speaking to me right there. And, and the Lord reminded me of where he's brought me from because from, it wasn't me. I know now it wasn't me, but I'm going to get into this message today, um, and we're going to wrap up this series, uh, An Enemy Exposed is an Enemy Defeated. Can I tell you that this is one of the hardest sermon series that I've had to study and put together. I'm I was challenged at every aspect. I was distracted. Things would come up. I had car issues. I had house issues. I had a bunch of issues. Everything that would take me away from studying, I'm telling you, even last night, I, I usually study on Friday or Saturday night, and just to let you know, and I spend about a good, you know, several hours. I could not think straight last night, and I was, I was trying to get to get, I was up until, I don't know, after midnight trying to focus. I just, I just prayed and went to bed. I got up this morning, and I, and I remember just praying, and Lord, and uh, if I tell you what I went through, <laughs> I usually have my messages at least a week done in advance, and I started a new one last night. And I could, it was, it was, woo, God will be glorified. God will be glorified. And, and I, I knew what I was talking about, but there was just so many distractions. So to, today, the title of this message is Reflecting Jesus, to reflect Jesus. I'm telling you, as we expose the enemy, we don't expose him more than we reflect Jesus. When we are Christ-like, oh man, the devil hates that. He hates that because he wants us 
to be everything but Christ. He wants us to be the old way, the old way that you were. He's going to remind you of your past. He's going to remind you of who you really are inside. At church, I'm holy and I act right, but outside, the real me comes out. He's going to say, why do you go to church? You know when you, once you leave that door, you're going to act the same way. He's going to remind you of that stuff. But let me show as I get into this, and that's what I was going through last night. And I, just reminding me of everything else, distractions, I got phone calls, I'll get text messages, reminding me of what happens when you take your eyes off Jesus. The theme scripture for this sermon series was 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Uh, and you'll read it with me here. It says, stay alert. Watch out for the great enemy, the devil. Who's the great enemy? The devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Amen. So let's pray as we get started today. So Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord, that we're here today in your presence. There's no better place to be than with you. And I ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit flow in here, touch every heart, every mind. Oh, Lord, remove every distraction from our thoughts. Lord, we bind up the, the lies of the enemy and we cast them down to the pit of hell. And I pray right now, anything not of you would be bound and cast away. Oh, Lord, let, we are free to hear from you, to receive. Pour into us. Holy Spirit, pour into us. Do what only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And I, I want to ask you this. I want to tell you this. I don't want to ask you that you belong to the Lord. When you receive him, you belong to the Lord. And when you, when you belong to the Lord, the Lord's, the Bible says that you have light of the Lord. You have light. We've been talking about darkness and defeating it. But do you know, no matter how you feel, you have light if you're a child of God. Ephesians chapter 5, 8 says, For once you were full of darkness. This, I'm speaking to everybody. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So what? So live as people of light. But pastor, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what I'm going through. I don't feel like shining my light. I don't feel like living holy. I don't feel like doing the right thing. I want to be mad right now. And you know what? I don't care what happens right now. I don't care what people think. Yeah, you do because you get mad when they think a certain way. But I'm telling you, the strategy of the enemy is to make you forget that you don't have light. I'm telling you, I work in the power industry and I know how valuable light is and, and how powerful it is because any dark place that you're in, it could be pitch black, so dark you can't see the hand in front of you, but light a match. That's why when engineers, when they design a path of egress, when there's an emergency and, and, they, and they say, okay, we're going to light up a path so you can see on your way out, they say, make it one foot candles. One foot candle because that, uh, that bright light of a candle can illuminate the darkness. It illuminates, it'll illuminate a path. You won't see anything else on the sides, but you'll see the light. You will see the light. And that's how we have to live as believers. But you're the light. When you receive the Lord, you're the light. And that's the thing. No matter what you're going through, no matter your circumstance, no matter how you feel, once you're a child of God, that light is in you. Now, it's up to you how you want to shine it. Do you want to shine it or do you want to hide it? Do you want to go in a place where there's a bunch of darkness and just fit in? Do you want to go where everybody's acting crazy and just fit in? Or do you want to be the light in that dark place? Because that light will touch people. And when it touches people, God is glorified. And they're glorified because God is glorified because of your testimony. Because people are like, what's, what's, what's different about you? Man, what's different about you? I don't feel comfortable around you. Or, man, why are you so joyful? Why are you this way? And all of a sudden, you know what? I, Jesus made me this way. Or if you don't want to say that, some people don't want to say that because they say, oh, I don't want to start a conversation. But that's a strategy of the enemy to remove the praise of God out of your mouth. It's not always easy. I know you may, you may say, well, they, what if they ask me a question about God? I'm not going to know how to answer them. I don't know how to, I don't know if they believe a certain way. I'm not good at convincing people. It's not your job to convince them. It's not your job to convince them. Only God does that. God brings some conviction. It's not your job to make somebody feel guilty. God brings the conviction, and he changes people, not us. He changes people. So take the pressure off yourself. And you know what? If you're, if you're around people that are negative, be the light. Be positive. Show them who you are. Here's the thing. A lot of people, whether you know it or whether you believe it or not, are watching you. 
Every one of you in here, if you say you go to church, they're watching you. They want to see if you're being real or not. They want to see, oh, there's another fake Christian. Because they act one way in church and the other way on the outside. Can I tell you, even when you're in public, even when you're in public and you're, try, and you're trying to be a witness, trying to be nice, you know, to the, you're going out to a restaurant and you're like, oh, yeah, you know, praise God. And we're praying and all that stuff. And the waitress comes around and she gets your order wrong. How do you respond to that? Come on, I've been there. Where's my fries? You didn't get my fries. How do you feel about that? And then all of a sudden, uh, uh, there's an opportunity to, to say something nice because they're having a bad day. And, they, and they, they hear you praying, and they see you praising God, and all of a sudden you're about to leave, and you don't give them a tip. Or you go, oh, I didn't get the good service. Let me leave them a nickel or a penny. Come on. Would Christ do that? Would Jesus do that? you got to be a light in that situation. A light is not, it, it's easier said than done. Can I tell you, when you're not feeling it, it's hard to do that, amen? But with, through Christ, you're able to do that. See, God is light with us. He makes us, he makes us shine And as believers, we're supposed to shine brighter than anybody else. As believers of God, we're supposed to testify of the reality who Christ is because that will bring him glory. Let your light shine bright because what what happens is, you're like, Pastor, how do I do that? Your good deeds. When you act, when you do things good, like my brother was talking about, when you bless somebody that, that needs money, are they hungry? When you bless them, God is glorified. God is glorified because of the light in you we're able to make a difference in any dark place. We can tell the difference between right and wrong, and you know that with the Holy Spirit, that conviction that can settle in. You know the difference between good and evil. I know, I know sometimes we say, well, it's questionable. No. There's no gray area. Either it's good or it's evil. Either it's the truth or it's not the truth. Amen? And, sometimes it, and what's of God? There's one way. If it's not of God, then you know it's the other way. You know that. So let it shine brightly. And I'm gonna and stick with me because I'm gonna get somewhere with this. I was so convicted last night because uh, I was I was writing a message last night that was kind of different than what God was showing me originally a couple weeks ago. And all of a sudden I'm like, Lord, I can't think because you know, which which way do you want me to go? And the words weren't coming. It was kind of like writer's block. I was trying to hear from the Lord, and I'm like, why, why isn't it making sense to me what I'm saying? And believe me, it takes a long time sometimes to sit there and just receive from God. And all of a sudden, I, the, God, uh, the Lord just put on my heart, because I couldn't think. He said, I thought you were going to talk about the armor of God. Haven't I been saying that? I go, but Lord, but I felt this way. Okay, I know you did. And I'm like, okay, let me turn to Ephesians then. I was already in Ephesians. But let me say this, because I want you to know, church, that God wants you to shine your light. And what we say as people is like, well, when we go through things, it's hard to shine brightly. And... I know one thing that I was missing before. As a new believer, I wanted to read the word. I wanted to pray. I wanted to share my testimony. But I never protected myself from fiery darts. Those fiery darts come as accusations, people mocking you, making fun of you, challenging you, doing all these things to distract you from who God is and what he's doing in your life. I was focusing on my situation. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray this through. I'm going to read through the word of God. I'm just going to read blindly. I'm just going to read, 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 and God's word is going to show me, and God can do that. But however, the Bible gives us specific instructions because the fiery darts are going to come for you. If you are a believer in Jesus, you are a target. You are a target, and the enemy hates you. I know nobody wants to feel like they're hated, but the devil wants you dead. The devil doesn't want you to do God's will. The devil wants you sad and miserable. The devil wants you angry all the time. The devil wants you to blow your testimony. The devil wants you not to come to church anymore. The devil doesn't want you to praise God. If he can do that, that's his strategy to distract you and to deter you, to discourage you. But the Bible says, arm yourself. You're you're fighting a battle and you're trying to fight without armor. That's, how it, that's what it feels like spiritually. You're fighting a battle with no armor on. And so the Bible gives us clear instructions in Ephesians chapter 6. And I'm going to read these verses here. And we're just going to dive in. I mean, oh, man, when I, got, when I started writing, I just kept writing. God was just, okay, give me this, give me this. And I'm just writing away because now I'm, doing, I'm where God wants me to be. Because it's easy to get distracted and start doing your own thing. But Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. I'm going to read verses 10 through 17. Verse 10 says, a final word, a final word. Be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. 
Put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. There are so many strategies the devil will come, out, come at you. There are things that bother you that might not bother somebody else, but they'll happen to you. Things that get under your nerves will happen to you. It might not bother somebody, but it's going to happen to you. The Bible is very clear to put on all of God's armor so that you're able to stand firm. People say, Pastor, I'm just weak. I feel beat up. And people say, and I, and I can't remember, was it Bullet, Pastor Bullet that said it? He's like, he was telling me a story, and he was saying that somebody was, Pastor, I, every morning I get up and I put on the armor of God. Every day, every day I get up, first thing I do is pray. I put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. I, I put on the shoes of peace, the belt of truth, my sword. And he's like, you mean you take it off? Or did you tell me that? Somebody told me that. Yeah, I was like, oh, that, that was so awesome because... That's the way people pray. But the, but the Bible, does, it doesn't say, now take off your armor when you go to bed. Because what happens at night? The battles, right? And, I, and you think about that. Every day, there's, people, there's pastors. I mean, they're probably, pastors probably laughing at me. But I would say this. Why do you take off your armor? The Bible doesn't say take off your armor to go to sleep. Do you, do you remove your salvation when you go to sleep? Because you know what happens when you read your word? Whatever, can I tell you this from experience, that anything you watch or read before you go to bed, there's a high chance that you're going to dream about those things. If you're watching scary movies at night, you may have something will happen at night like that. So I'm saying, so it was you, Brother Armando, but I remember hearing that you take it off, and I'm like, I never heard it that way, but it's true. You have to get up every morning and put your armor on. That's, yeah, I get it. Praise God you put it on, but why do you take it off? Why do you take it off? Amen. So let me keep reading. Uh, verse 12. Verse 12. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. Can, can we all agree on that? We're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. Against mighty powers. Mighty powers in this, what? Dark world. We agreed when I first started this series. Do we live in a dark world? Is there darkness everywhere around us? Against what? Evil spirits in the heavenly places. I'm telling you, you have, we have a real enemy. And he doesn't play fair. When you're down, he will try to kick you even more to stay down. He'll say, don't go to church today. Don't read your Bible today. He has done nothing good for you. He'll say those things, but they're all lies from the pit of hell. There is a, a war being waged against you right now. In your mind, there will be things that you remember, things of your past. Things will come up on your social media that you're trying to avoid. Things will come up any chance you have, anywhere you turn your eyes. If it's on, on Jesus, it'll be right in front of you to tempt you. Let me keep going. Verse 13. Verse 13. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor, every piece of God's armor, so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. In those times, in those evil times, when you get bad news, when, some, when you get a bad phone call, when something happens at work, when a neighbor comes against you, when a family member, I don't know, you have a problem, all those times that, that, that make you feel afraid, make you scared, to make you doubt, to make you confused, all those things you can't resist until you have the armor of God. The Bible says, so that you'll be able to resist the devil, your enemy, at the time of evil. Hear me now. Then after the battle, then after the battle, because not if the battle comes, but then after the battle, you'll be standing firm. You'll be standing firm. You'll be standing firm. Verse 14, stand your ground. Stand your ground. Putting on the belt of truth and the, the body armor of God's righteousness. Can I tell you that body armor or breastplate, it's there to guard your heart. I'm telling you, there are so many ways the enemy will use to get you to hurt your heart, to hurt your pride, to hurt you. And I'm not talking about the evil pride. You know, you should take care of yourself because you are the temple where God resides. You should take care of yourself. Take pride in yourself that you know you are a temple. You are a vessel for the Lord. You are a good, honorable vessel for the Lord. Guard your heart. Guard your heart because this world is dark. Don't you realize in a dark place, it wants to consume all that it can, but it can't consume light. 
Darkness cannot consume light. No matter how dark it is, the smallest speck of light will light up. It'll light up. Amen? Verse 15, for shoes, for shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you'll be fully prepared. I'm telling you, I, will, I tell this to certain people when we're talking about it. When you go into a place that you're not familiar with, wherever you go, make sure you pray for that place if you're going to be there any particular time. Pray for yourself. Take dominion there. Everywhere you step, claim God's peace. Everywhere you step, you're covered by the blood of Jesus, the power of it. I think I told a story about my kids. When I travel, when, anytime I travel, I, before I go into a hotel, I pray that Jesus just fills that place. Holy Spirit, fill this room, consume it, because I know what happens if I don't do that. Just, I, I don't want, you know what, devil, you don't belong here. Anything not of Jesus, anything not holy, be cast out in Jesus' name. And then when my kids, when my mother-in-law offered to watch the kids, she was staying in another hotel room. When they went in, she went in, and they're just like waiting for her. And they say, Grandma, are you going to pray for the room? She goes, oh, yeah, right away. She's a praying woman. My, my, grand, my, my, uh, my mother-in-law is a praying woman. And, and so it, it, it warmed my heart to know that my kids know when we go into a new place, we're going to pray for it. I'm telling you, if you don't do it, you have to do it. When you go into a place where you're visiting people, Pray, whether it's a convalescent home, whether it's a hospital, wherever it's at. If it's a funeral home, go in and claim that place for Jesus. Claim it. Put your stake in there and say, you know what? I walk right now. I'm the light. Any darkness needs to be cast away. Any darkness. And you go in there and you walk in with the peace of God because you know that you're protected. Amen? Amen. Uh, uh, number, verse 16. In addition, listen to me, in addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Do you realize there are fiery darts being shot at you to take you out? But like we've read in Daniel, there are, there are, there are things happening in the spiritual realm that are protecting you, that are, you know what, you, when your prayers go up, the enemy doesn't want your prayer to be answered. But the re reality is he can't stop that. He can't stop your prayers from God. But the thing is that they will shoot different things to get under your skin. When somebody talks, when they have a foul mouth and they say, you know, uh, uh, bad words or inappropriate things, those are darts being spewed out. Now, they may not think that. They may think it's innocent, but not to a child of God. They are meant to distract you, to offend you, to, to get under your skin. All these things to get you thinking about that stuff and not God. I'm telling you, you have a real shield of faith. Don't let, you know what happened? You know why the, faith, the, the, the shield of faith is so important? If anything that is said to you that can make you question your faith, it's going to come at you. But when you have a shield of faith, it's guarded. But anything, and I'm telling you, whether you read something, whether you, 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 you see something on, online or on the news, anything that will make you question, well, why don't we do this or why don't we do that? Anything meant to... Question your faith, you have to have up your shield of faith to protect it. Pre protect your faith. Don't let, believe what you believe. Don't let anything make you question who God is in your life. And this one right here, this is a big one right here. In verse 17, put on salvation as your helmet. I'm telling you, put on salvation as your helmet. It's so important that you put on that helmet of salvation because you know what happens in the mind? I keep remembering when, when Mackenzie said it was the battlefield. Your mind is a battlefield, and the enemy doesn't play fair. And especially if you're not reading your word, especially if you're not praying, especially if you're not in fellowship. I'm telling you how important fellowship is. It's so important not to isolate and stay away. It's so important to be around like-minded believers. It's so important for your health spiritually. It's so important because God can speak to us in different ways. He can speak to us through his word, through when we're, when we're praying to him. He can speak through other people. He can speak through your pain and your circumstance. He can show you different things, how not to do things or how not to act. Because you know what? He'll show you what it's like when somebody else does it. You're like, oh, man, I do that. That doesn't look right. That doesn't sound right. God will remind you. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, anything that will make you question who you are in God is not of God. 
enemy not making question. So you put on your, 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 your salvation as your helmet, protect it because you are saved and you are loved by God. You are saved, you are his. He paid for you. He bought you with the price of his blood. He paid, he's already bought it. And it's not for you to sell. He paid for you already. You don't own yourself. He owns you. How, do, how, does, how, how, do, how does the clay tell the potter how to mold him? Right? And take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Can I tell you how valuable that sword is? You know, we, 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 sometimes we can take it lightly. Be like, well, I read. I read. But the power in that in that sword, is, is, it, it's so powerful. The Passion Translation says this. It says, and take the mighty razor sharp spirit sword of the spoken word of God. Take the mighty razor sharp spirit sword of the spoken word of God. It's so powerful. And as believers, we shouldn't wait back to be, we shouldn't stand back and wait to be attacked. We should go on the offensive. Anything that would question God, you cut it off right there. Any, anything. Family and friends, if they try to knock you or whatever, you, you pray for them. But you take up, the, take up the sword of the spirit and say, I'm a child of God. You're not going to distract me. You're not going to get under my skin because people closest to you will tend to hurt us, maybe unintentionally or intentionally. People closest to us, that's what happens. The enemy will use those closer to us. And there's nobody closer than somebody in our house. No, 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 Pastor, I, they, I love them. They love me. Yes, indeed. There is love there, but is it unconditional love? When somebody hurts anybody, it's, you know, a, a reaction will come out. I'm telling you how important it is to use the word of God as, 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 a, as a weapon of offense to cut off the lives of the enemy. Be on the, don't let the enemy fester with his ways and his lies. Use the sword of the spirit to cut it off. Cut off the lies of the enemy. Amen. We need to prepare ourselves, church. Prepare ourselves against an enemy that's not flesh and blood. I want you to know when you get upset, when you get frustrated, when you get discouraged by something or someone, remember the real enemy, who it is. It's not your family. I'm telling you. Now, can the enemy use somebody in your family? Probably, probably. But it's not your, it's not your husband or your wife. It's not your coworker. It's not your neighbor that plays their music too loud. It's not your kids when they don't listen. I know, I know sometimes, you know, kids act up and stuff. We want to go, hey, stop already, right? That's not the enemy. No, know who your enemy is, exposed, and once exposed, use that razor-sharp sword, that sword spirit to defeat him. Amen? Amen. So, so let, me, let, let, me, uh, let me be transparent here. Because you know what? I said this earlier when I was opening up. Yeah, we're getting towards the end of the year. Amen. We're, you know, and some of the... some. This year has been rough in so many ways for so many people. It's been rough. You know, uh, whether it was a sickness, whether it was death, whether it was financial, whether it was relational. There's a lot of things that happened this year that can cause you to think, that can take your eyes off the Lord. And, but we're coming up on a new season. We're coming up on a new season. I'm telling you, some of us are looking forward to it. Some of us are like, oh, I can wait for that. Oh, it's tax season coming up. I don't know. Different things, right? But a new season is coming. It doesn't stop because of your circumstance. It doesn't stop because of the way you feel. A new year is coming. But what's not new, it's the same threat, the same tactics, the same strategy from the devil. He will use the same ones. You know why? Because it worked. Amen. You get a star after class. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> but that's true. You know why the enemy keeps doing what he always does? Because it works. Can he get under your, can people get under your skin? It works. Can people drive you nuts? It works. Can people discourage you? It works. Can people do all these things? It works because why? We live in a fallen world with, with people that are imperfect, right? That make imperfect decisions. We are human. It's natural for us to be affected by it. But what does the Bible say do? Put on the whole armor of God, the helmet of salvation. That is your salvation. Don't let the enemy lie to you. You are a child of God. Though your circumstance doesn't make you less of a, of a child of God. Your circumstance doesn't change the love of God. The circumstance that you're in, no matter how you feel, doesn't make God feel less about you. Man, it doesn't change that. And because of who we are and he who's in us, we need to do our part. We need to do our part. We need to love 
one another. Your family needs you. Your kids need you. All those people that are counting on you need you. Your unsaved family needs you more desperately than ever. Time is running out. And, and I remember, you know, growing up or, or hearing about, oh, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Get saved now. And this was like in the 70s. And get saved. And there was a movement. And, and all my family was getting saved. And they were falling in and out. My, all my aunts and uncles would go to church. And they would fall out. Oh, but, you know, the, the time is of essence. Jesus is coming now. He's coming now. Get ready. And then when I got older and I would hear it, man, they said Jesus is coming 20, 30 years ago. They've been saying that all this century. Jesus is coming back. And, and I go, yeah, when's he going to come back? But the Bible says, thank God he's not being slow. For you. But he's giving you time. He's giving our family time. Thank God he didn't come back in the 80s because I didn't know him. Thank God he didn't come back yesterday because I have family members that are not saved yet. Thank God that he's tarrying right now, giving us time to reach the lost, to reach those that don't know him, to be a good witness to our family, to show somebody love, to bless a waitress or a waiter, to bless those that have a need, that are, that are on the corner asking for money. We don't know their situation. Whatever the intent is of them, what's the intent of us? To bless them, right? To be used by God to bless somebody, to give somebody an encouraging word. Oh, pastor, I know they're faking it. So what? That's what they're dealing with. Maybe they haven't been loved enough. That's why they act that way. Maybe, well, they just have hate in their heart and they're mean. But have you hugged them and loved on them? Maybe, maybe they've never experienced that. They don't, know how to, they don't know how to receive it. Oh, pastor, when I talk to them, they just shut me down. Oh, pastor, when I do this, I tell them about Jesus. They say, oh, I don't want to hear about your God. But they don't know him. That's why they say that. How will they know unless somebody tells them? How will they know? I'm telling you, this is the time. We talked about defeating darkness. We talked about overcoming. We talked about the strategies of the enemy. An enemy exposed is the enemy defeated. Who's going to defeat the enemy if you don't? In your household, who's going to defeat the enemy if you're the believer? It's a spiritual warfare. The enemy is not flesh and blood. If, in your, if, if you know the Lord and you are in your house, I would want all my family protected. From the strategies of the devil. All of them. And I would do whatever it took. If it took reading. If it took praying. Worship music in my house. That is your mission field right there. That's your battleground. I want everybody in your house to be saved. When I tell people. When people come to my house. They, I've had people stay at my house. And not stay there. Because they're, they're uncomfortable. You know why? They don't know the Lord. And if they're not gonna, if they can't come. If they, I mean, they're going to hear it from me. Everybody that works. That, that helps me with my house. Whether it's the pool guy or whatever. I tell them about Jesus. This is why we're here. This is my home. And, 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 and some of them don't come back. Now, it might be in their excuse, whatever reason. I don't know what their reasons are. But I know that when they come to my house, they're going to hear who Jesus is. They're going to hear who the Lord is. I, it's an opportunity for them to give their lives if they haven't already. Your family needs you guys. Church, your family needs you. You know them more than, you know them, I don't know them. And you know what they struggle with. Tell them about Jesus because you know what? The family is one of the biggest targets for the enemy. Because the devil knows that if he breaks apart the family, everybody goes their separate ways. So do you know, and this is statistically speaking, that when a mother gets saved and a mother comes to Christ, her family will only join her 17% of the time. When the man, the father, the priest of the home comes to Christ, his family joins him 93% of the time. These are statistics. I'm not making this up. So I say this to the men of God in this place. Your family needs you. Your kids need you. Your wife needs you. Your family needs you. Women of God. Your man needs you. Your husband needs you. Let me tell you why. The minute, and I'm going to tell you why right now, we're going to speak some truth. The minute there's something that goes wrong in the house, in the job, or whatever, any opposition, statistically speaking, who are the first ones to leave church? The men. The men get angry and they leave. I think women start thinking, oh, you know what? I, women already know they need Jesus, so they stay. But when a man gets offended, he will leave faster than a woman. That's just statistically speaking, that when men leave church, they leave the kingdom of God. And what happens, they leave and they bounce church to church to church until eventually they say all churches are the same and they don't come back and they don't come back 
it's a strategy from the pit of hell. If the devil can trip you up, if the devil can distract you, he will distract you first to take the head out. He will take the head out so the family crumbles. Now, I would say this, a woman that leads her home, that same thing applies. When the woman leads her home and she is the spiritual leader of her home, your family needs you. Your family needs you to keep praying no matter what, no matter your circumstance, no matter how you feel. We don't serve God based on our emotions. Amen. I'm telling you, it's a spiritual warfare. And I, and I feel like during this month of Thanksgiving, right, it's all been about darkness. And that hasn't been my intention. It's been about defeating darkness, exposing the enemy. We should bring thanks every day, not just a month, not just a holiday week. We should always bring thanksgiving to God. It says it in his word. We bring thanksgiving to him. When, I, when we come into his presence, we should be thankful and grateful for all that he's done and what he's going to do. He's not finished with you yet. If you have breath in your lungs, he's just beginning. I'm telling you, don't ever feel like, you know what, I, I've had my time or I've been serving God a long time. It doesn't matter how long he's not done yet. He's not back yet. When he comes back and we, and we ride into glory with him, I'm telling you, the enemy is a, is a real threat to all of us. I like what uh, Pastor Bula said when he was here. because I, And I say this all the time. And, and you know what? It, it's, it's, it's the truth. We say as believers, as Christians, that Jesus, we want people to know the reason why Christians celebrate Christmas is, is to acknowledge Jesus' birth. It's not about Santa Claus and, holiday, and gifts and all that stuff. All things, all those things are good. But I'm telling you, I like what Pastor Bula said. He said that Jesus is the reason, Period. He's the reason for everything. He's the reason. He's the reason of our being. He's the reason. He's the reason. And the Lord has called you for a reason. He's called you for his purpose and his will to walk in light, to expose the darkness, to expose the enemies, to expose his strategies, to light up in a dark place. But what does it mean to walk in the light? What does it mean to walk in light? Mackenzie, you can come up. What does it mean to walk in the light? In 1 John chapter 1, I'm going to read this. It's going to be up on the screen. But 1 John chapter 1, let me read verses 5 through 9. 1 John chapter 1, 5 through 9. This is the message we heard from Jesus. And now I'll declare to you, God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. But if we are living in the light, as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other. You hear me? Fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Did you hear that? As children of light, at the light, what should we be doing? But if we are living in the light, as God is in the light, then we should be fellowship with who? Each other. That's the word of God. If we claim to have no sin... We are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. Why wouldn't you want to be cleansed when you're going through something? That's the one thing. Believers get beat up sometimes. You know what? They go through seasons where, you know what, they're struggling. It happens. But if you know that, only you know what you're feeling in your heart. We don't know. God knows. God knows. If we say we're believers, but we don't like to fellowship, what is that saying? The Bible says, if you are living in the light, as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other. Now, I know COVID changed some of that because they said, don't fellowship. Do you see how that's a strategy too? Stay away from everybody. Stay in your house. Be isolated. Now, for me, I don't know, whatever your political stance is, I'm not here to debate that. But I know one thing the Bible says we need to be in fellowship with one another. To be in fellowship. See that, see this, this passage right here in John's epistle, it's written, if you, if you go back and read 1 John, he's writing it to encourage the believer because they're discouraged during the process of life, the ups and downs of life. He's encouraging them in their faith. He's saying there's going to be things that happen. There's going to be things. And, and so he's saying that God is light. There is no darkness in him. And so you're lying if you say you're in fellowship with God. Oh, you know what? I, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer in Jesus. I serve him. 
I acknowledge him, I'm saved, and, and, and you know what, I just don't go to church because I don't want to be around those people. I don't want to be around, you know, because, you know, some people are fake and some people this and that. But I'm telling you, there is spiritual darkness. There is spiritual darkness. But if we are living in the light, if you confess to be a believer, if you say you've been saved by God and his grace, I'm telling you, because he is light, then you be in fellowship with one another. It's the truth. It's the word of God. No matter our struggle, hear me, church, no matter our struggle, whether it's inside or outside of us, our faith shouldn't be based on our circumstance. Our faith shouldn't change based on our circumstance. But it should be based on God's grace for our lives. See, our calling is to live each day influenced by the Holy Spirit. Influenced by the Holy Spirit. To allow Christ to shine through us. To sh shine his love. Shine what people need. There's a lot of people that don't know the Lord. Or they knew him, but they walked away. And they said, oh man, when I was in church, nobody greeted me. Nobody hugged me. I didn't have any friends there. Everybody was fake. And all of a sudden, God sends you. Are you going to be the same way? Are you going to be the same way with a brother or sister that, that's been hurt? Oh, yeah, they just get hurt by everything, whatever. It happens. But we have to walk in light. We have to reflect Jesus. We have to reflect who we are in him, who we, he's, who's in us. Listen, we only become a light in the world after we receive Jesus and accept him as Lord and Savior. And then we have a responsibility. That responsibility is to shine. Yes, you know what, not, we're all not going to go be preachers. We're not all going to be evangelists. We're not all going to do that. But you all have a light to shine. You could be a blessing to someone. What, whatever you feel God do, you have a responsibility to shine your light. If you're in a dark place and there's 10 people with you and you have a flashlight, are you going to turn it on? Or just leave it off and wander miserably, not knowing where to go. You're a believer, and there's many unbelievers around you, and they're in a dark place. Don't you want to shine so they can see their way? Don't you want to shine the way to Jesus? Don't you want to reflect Jesus so they know that there's hope? There's many broken people in the world. Many broken people. And I know this, because it, it, it's funny, because the company I work for Little shout out to my company, Perfect Power. How did that happen? Perfect Power. I work for Perfect Power. Perfect Power. And I talk to so many people, and they know I'm a pastor, and I share my testimony. And I'll ask it for you, Rudy. You had struggles. You don't struggle? Yeah, but I deal. How do you deal with it? The bar? Drugs? Yelling at your family? Treating them bad? leaving your wife at home and you go do your own thing? How do you handle your struggles? Oh, I do it my way. That's why I went to Jesus, because I used to do it that way, and it doesn't work. That way doesn't work. See, in salvation, God brings the light so bright. Now I'm going to share something with you as we're getting ready to end right here. Being in the light it's not the same as walking in the light. There's a difference between having a relationship with God and having fellowship with God. So listen to me. As a father, as a parent, I have children. And I know my, you know, I, a lot of you know that, you know, I shared my story, you know, my daughters and stuff. And praise God, God is restoring every day. But can I tell you, as a father, as a parent, they were born of me. They were my, they're my kids, and therefore I have a relationship with them. They couldn't choose who they wanted to be their father. They got me. Surprise. Hello, it's me. I was the one that fathered them, and nothing they can do can change that. They are my children. But just because I'm their father doesn't guarantee a relationship, a fellowship, and intimacy. Just because I, I, I bore them or my wife bore them and, and just because, you know, I, I'm their physical, natural, biological father does not guarantee a relationship with them. See, intimacy is based on time when you spend together with your children, on your, 
grandchildren. Intimacy is spending time and communicating and, 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 and oh, communication and obedience and all these things. Are you seeing a picture here? I'm, I'm trying to paint this picture. Spending time with your children, communicating, be, being in obedience to what God has told you to do with them and them responding in that. Do you see all that? Do you agree with that? And so it is with God. And so it is with God. We can say, oh, I follow Jesus. I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a believer. Yes, you are saved. But don't you want all that God has for you, the blessing he has for you? Why wouldn't you build a relationship with your father? See, our relationship with him begins at salvation. When you get saved, you are now in relationship with Jesus. But our relationship only grows when you become to know him, when you spend time with him, when you spend time in fellowship, in prayer, in reading his word, going deeper in him and becoming obedient to what he says. All that becomes, how can you be obedient if you don't know who he is? People think obedience is a bad word. Oh, I can't be obedient or submit to this person. But if you knew who he is and who he and what he and, when, and who, what he stands for. See, it's a response to his word and the will for our lives. And I'm almost finished here. To walk in light, to be in light, to walk in light, two different things. If you walk in light, be transparent with each other, with your pastor. Don't suffer in darkness. Don't suffer alone. Don't suffer with the strategy of the enemy because he'll use that. Be above reproach. That's a good word. You know what that word means? Be above the expression of disappointment. Don't give anybody room to talk about you. Don't, don't. People want to talk about something they see. They want to gossip. When you're above that, they can't say anything about you to, to knock you, to make, you know what? We always say consider the source. People will lie about you. People will say things to make you look bad. Be above that. Refuse to hide anything that you don't want anybody to see. Don't do things in privacy. You wouldn't do things in public. Because God sees, right? God sees. Now, I always say this. I'm speaking to myself. When I write these messages, I mean, God was dealing with me last night. This morning I was writing. Who are you? Are you in the light? Are you walking in the light? Do you put on your armor of God to protect yourself? Because how are you a warrior? Because we're in the battle. Why wouldn't you use the armor God has given you and the weapons to attack, to defend yourself? To walk in light means activity. In other words, reflecting Jesus. Reflecting Jesus. Loving others the way Jesus loves. Loving others. See, the love of Christ, the love of Jesus compels us. You know what? I'm convinced. And, and, I, and as I was sitting there last night, I was thinking, if you have a problem, if you have a talking problem about God, are you walking with him? Is it, if we don't talk about him or share him, are we walking with him? Can I say this, that a believer... A person that's a believer, it doesn't, go, it doesn't go hand in hand. If you're a believer, you're a witness. Because what made you believe? When you received the Lord, something happened to cause you to believe. So you're a witness to what God has done. You can't be a Christian and not a witness. Now, I'm not saying you got to go share everything because you might not know everything. But if you are a believer, if you are a Christian, if you are in Christ, if you're walking in Christ, then you're a witness. Because why would you if he hasn't shown himself to you? People just, you know what? It's a miracle of God when somebody just believes and never met Jesus. I mean, could it happen? Yeah. Didn't happen for me. It's been a process. Let me read what, and I'm, I'm, I'm closing. I always say that. Charles Spurgeon. You know what I do? And I think most pastors do this. You write and you write and God's putting stuff in your right. Oh, that would be good. Oh, I want to say this. Oh, Lord, okay. You get so much and then you think, it's not going to, I mean, I don't know, when you're preaching, if you're led by the Spirit, sometimes things are overlooked or, I never stay on my notes, right? And I'm going back and forth, and I'm like, okay, this came up. Charles Spurgeon, the pastor in the 20th century, 
very famous, very, very uh, just wise. He said this, because this supports my message. To walk in the light is to live moment by moment, abiding in holy intimacy with God in every aspect of our lives, compelled into action by a relationship with God. It's a lifestyle that imitates the character and actions of Jesus as it seeks to share the love of God with others. It's not trying to live your best life for Jesus, but rather living alert to God's truth under the influence of the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, it's spiritual warfare. It's spiritual warfare. You can't fight the battle. We can't fight the battle without the Spirit. Spiritual warfare. We've been talking about spiritual darkness, darkness, and, and who our real enemy is. I'm telling you, it's spiritual warfare. If you want to get better, seek the Lord. Seek Him in, in truth and the Spirit. John 3.30 says, he must increase, but I must decrease. Let Christ shine his light through you. Let it shine. You know why sometimes we feel like the light isn't bright enough? Because we're thinking about all the things that consume us. All the, the problems, the financial, the relationship, the health. All these things overshadow your light. But if he increases and we decrease, the light shines brighter. And in closing, how do we reflect Jesus? And I'm going to read 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. It says, have nothing to do with godless myths or old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value. Hear me now. Physical training, I need some of that, should be, is, is of some value. But godliness has value for all things holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. You see, it requires serving the Lord, understanding, effort, sacrifice, commitment, discipline. Like I said earlier, salvation is the first part of the relationship with the Lord. And the spiritual battles start happening. And it, it, it's hard because when you first come to the Lord, we get saved, we receive the Lord. Oh, yes, hallelujah. Jesus, thank you. And we walk out, we expect everything to be good. Now the battles begin, but we're not spiritually prepared because we don't know. And if, how will you know unless somebody tells you? How will you know that there's an armor of God, that there's, a, there's, there's instruction in the Bible? That right there, you need to read that. How do you know? How do new believers know that unless they come to church and in fellowship, right? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 to 3 says this. Hebrews chapter 12. We must keep our eyes on Jesus who leads us and makes our faith complete. He endured the shame of being nailed to a cross because he knew later on he would be glad he did. Now he is seated at the right side of God's throne. So keep your mind on Jesus who put up with many insults from sinners then you won't get discouraged and give up. You know, we put it in that perspective when, when you think about, you know, what we go through and you think about what Jesus suffered for us. It puts it in perspective, the way he was beaten and, and, and just tortured and nailed on a cross, all that stuff, all the people that hated him, that crucified him, he did it for you because later on he knew he would be glad he did that you would have a place in eternity with him. So keep your mind on Jesus, who put up with many insults from sinners, then you won't get discouraged and give up. Reflecting Jesus. Reflecting Jesus. The truth is, as we stay in fellowship with others, that's the intimacy with God that we need. Jesus unites us with our brothers and sisters, our family. How do they know that we're his disciples? John 13, 35 tells us, your love for one another, another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. 
Do you see where I went with this, church? As I wrap up this series of defeating darkness, an enemy exposed, the enemy defeated, I wanted you to know during this time who your real enemy is. He wants to discourage you. He wants to play mind games. He wants to take you out. So we expose him for who he is. We expose him for the things around us, the darkness around us. And to wrap up this series, you have a light in, in Jesus. There's a light so bright waiting to shine brightly, not because of your circumstance, because of who he is in you. Greater is he that is in me that is in the world. Greater is he. Let that light shine brightly. Now, that light might be dim. Like I said, there might be a lot of burden on you right now. That's why we do this. We come together in fellowship. What do we do? We encourage one another. We pray with one another. We hug one another. We you know, do everything we can because no believer wants another believer to suffer. That's a wrong heart if that's the case. That's not the heart of God. We shouldn't, we shouldn't rejoice in someone's suffering. Right? We rejoice when they rejoice. When they're in suffering, we, we, we team up with them. We team up with them because right now they might not be spiritually, spiritually strong when you are. We link our hearts and link our faith together. Say, oh, it's going to be okay. No, it's not. Yes, it is because God is good. I remember when I was crying and my, my son Zeke was, was dead on the table and they were doing CPR on a one-pound baby boy. And my wife's praising God and she's praising God. She's the babe, don't, don't stop praising him. Don't stop praising him. Keep praising God. I'm like, how do you praise God right now? She said, because he's good. No, he's not. Yes, he is. No, he's not. Yes, he is. Keep praising him. God knows what he's doing. He knew what he was doing in my life. He knows what he's doing in your life. He's the same. What he does for me, he does for you. He loves you. And he wants his people to love one another. Because that will show the world we are his disciples. Reflect Jesus. Be the light of the world. Amen. Matthew 5, 5, 14. You are the light of the world. Light up, a, light a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. You are the light of the world, believer, child of God. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. Shine and reflect Jesus. And he'll do the rest. You hear me? Shine and reflect Jesus. Let him do the rest. Let God do all the convincing. Let him do all the convicting. Let him do who, look who he's calling and let him convert and transform people. You just shine. Shine brightly. When people see you, let them see Jesus. Reflect Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. So, Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I thank you, Lord, for meeting us right here. Lord, I thank you for the people that are here today in person and those that are online, God. Father, I pray, Lord, that your word, Lord, ministers to every person. Father, we thank you for the word and the truth today. Father, I pray, Lord, as this word has gone forth, oh, Lord, it would bring increase to us, increase in our faith, in our boldness, in our witness to who you are. Father, today, Lord, I pray, Lord, the light of God that's in us would shine brightly more than ever. Father, I pray, Lord, that we would live a life, Lord, that would glorify you. Oh, Lord, I pray all that we do would bring you glory and honor. Father, you know what you're doing. You always know. And, Father, I pray as we go through things in life, we turn our eyes on Jesus. We don't look to the right or left, Lord, but we keep our eyes focused on you because you are the one that's going to bring us through. Father, you're our healer. You're our provider. You're the restorer, Lord. You are the deliverer. All those things, Lord, but you are our Savior. You have saved us, Lord, from this dark world. You have saved us for your purpose. You have saved us for your glory. Oh, Lord, be magnified in our hearts. Be magnified with our mouth, Lord God. Oh, let us stand true and declare who you are. Let us declare Jesus as Lord and Savior of everything, God. Oh, Lord, I pray today that, you are, that your people in here are built up, that they are edified today, Lord God. They are edified more than ever. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's give him some praise. Amen. Would you, would you stand to your feet with me? Would you stand to your feet as we close this?
but we're going to close service today. Amen. But before we do, I would say this. I know you, but I don't know what's going on inside in your heart. And if you need prayer, I want to invite you to the front up here to, to pray. You know, we can pray in private if you want to. I'll make the altars open or we can worship God together. Amen. Amen. Let's, let, let, let's worship the Lord. Mackenzie, lead us in, in song today. You're welcome to come up if you like. Amen. It was my cross you bore So I could live In the freedom you died for Yes. And now my life is yours And I will sing of your goodness forevermore. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. Deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. And now my shame is gone. I stand amazed in your love undeniable. Your grace goes on. We'll sing of your goodness forevermore. Cause worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. Deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. As worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. As worthy is your name, Jesus. Pastor Rudy, we appreciate you, everything you do. Everybody online, we appreciate you guys joining us. Everybody here, thank you.